Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Sabbath Services. Hope you're having a good Sabbath. This Sabbath, we're also going to cover more things on grace. So this will be grace number four, three phases of conversion or salvation and the heart-mind connection. Remember the three on grace, grace of God, God's grace and commandment keeping, grace upon grace, and this one you really need in the times of trouble that we're facing. So I, you, you can go ahead and order the one on the heart-mind connection because the heart and the mind work together. Now that's separate from the spirit of man. The spirit of man is the power of God's spirit for man that he put in there. Okay, This keeps everything going. James says in the last verse of James 2, that without the spirit, the body is dead. Okay? Now, spirit, you can't see it. You can't feel it. But I think they can, they can see it working when they have this uh, electronic scope like they have in hospitals, and it shows the brain waves because it empowers the brain. However, the heart also has neuro cells. And when you think with your heart more than with your mind, you will say, I feel. And that's true, because you're making an emotional connection with it rather than a mental, what is it, define it. This is, I feel. See? Now, let's look and see that there are three phases of being saved, or three phases of salvation. Come to Ephesians, the second chapter. Now, the book of Ephesians is really a tremendous book to read. Okay? and gives us a lot of understanding. Now remember, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Hebrews, and 2 Timothy were all written by Paul when he was in prison. And 2 Timothy was written just before he was martyred. And think about how the apostles felt. Okay. Think about this. They all start out doing miracles, healings, preachings, God opening doors, moving crowds of people, bringing them to repentance, to establish the church. And in the first 12 years, it went to all the Jews. And then Peter was the first one to go to the Gentiles, and God had to send him there by vision and by instruction. Because the Jews had a law that you cannot keep company with the Gentile or even be with them. So that law had to be demolished by God. So that's why he chose Cornelius. And it says in Acts the 10th chapter that Cornelius was a righteous man. Think about that. An Italian, uncircumcised. To a Jew, that's huh, unthinkable. <laughs> but God sent an angel to that man because his prayer was heard by God. And so then God sent Peter, right? 
You can read the rest of it, Acts the 10th chapter. Ephesians, the second chapter, here's where we're going. Okay. And this starts out from where we are when God calls it. And this becomes important also to never forget. Verse 1, now you were dead in trespasses and sins. Okay. In other words, since all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, until they repent and are baptized, they're walking dead in their trespasses and sins. Now that's why if we project forward to the second resurrection at the end of the millennium, why God has that time to offer them salvation. Because at this time, we're going to see it takes something special for us to come out of this. And only God can do it. Okay. Now notice verse 2. In which you walked in time past according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. And how many people really believe that Satan the devil is deceiving the whole world? Right now. Huh? If you walked up and told all these politicians enacting all of these satanic laws and things that they want to bring about, that you are an agent of Satan the devil and you are doing his work. See? You wouldn't last very long. See? Now notice, the spirit that is now working within the children of disobedience, he can affect the spirit of man. Okay? Now, the worst of that is possession. Right? And only the power of God can cast out the, the demons when they're possessed. And that's when people give themselves over to it. Well, you might say, well, what about little children? What about Mark the ninth chapter when this father came with his young boy and the disciples couldn't cast it out? So Jesus said, how long a time has this been with him? because it was casting him into the fire and into the water. And the father said, from childhood. Okay? That's why you need to discipline your children. That's why you need to understand what they're watching on television and smartphones. See? Because Satan is pouring through all of those things. Now, that's something. Possessed. Then the Phoenician woman whose daughter was grieved by his awful spirit, and she came behind Jesus and disciples and was irritating the disciples, and the disciples said to Jesus, tell her to go away. But she kept saying, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Okay? He didn't answer her. Finally, she got right up to him and said, Lord, my daughter is home vexed with a grievous spirit. What did Jesus say when she asked to have him cast out? He said, it's not right to take the children's bread and Give it to the dogs. Now, what an answer to her. Now, why did he do that? Because he wanted to see how persistent she was. Remember what she answered? She said, yes, Lord. But even the little dogs licked the crumbs from the table. Okay. Okay. He said, great is your faith. Go, your daughter is healed. 
So Satan is out there, and he is real at every level. The spirit that is now working within the children of disobedience, among whom also we all once had our conduct. Now think about what Paul is doing here. He's including himself, right? What made him to do all the things against the church that he did? Satan's spirit behind the high priest and with all of those who were with him to take people out and arrest them and put them in jail and condemn some to death. Okay? So he included himself, we. That's important to understand. See? Because all of us were there. We all once had our conduct in the lust of our own flesh, doing the things willed by the flesh and by the mind. And how many mistakes did that bring about? How much sorrow did that produce? See? God is going to save us from it, all right? And we're by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. But God, what is it said of God's relationship to people? God is a heart-knowing God. He knows the heart. He knows the thoughts. Right? See? That's why, in final analysis, we can only judge circumstances by what we see. God knows the heart. We don't. See? There are some people who think they know me. Well, they may know a lot about me, but they don't know me. None of us can say we really know any of us like God knows us. I mean, we can love one another. We can talk to one another. We can socialize with one another. We can discuss the Bible with one another and all of that sort of thing. We can pray for one another. But God knows the heart. That's the most important thing. See? So here, Paul, look what God had to do to call him. Here he was, triumphantly marching to Damascus with letters of arrest of those Christians in the synagogues who believed in Jesus. Well, when God's ready to do something, he does it. Bam! He knocked him down to the ground. <laughs> okay. Then he blinded him with a light that he couldn't even look at. Now, notice the change in his attitude suddenly. Huh? Here he was, I'm going to get those people and I'm going to put them in jail and those are worthy of death. Do them in. After that, he's on the, on the ground and saying, Lord, who are you? <laughs> and he said, Jesus, whom you persecute. What does that tell you? When we're persecuted, they're persecuting Jesus as well, because he is in us, right? Okay. Remember, God says, I am with you in all your troubles. Just because you have troubles doesn't mean that God has abandoned you. It just means you have troubles and go to God to help figure out what to do. Okay. There we are. Now notice, we all had our conduct, lesson of our flesh, doing things willed by the flesh, by the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he has loved us. Now think about this for a minute. How much love does God have? How much love does power does God have? And you just take the history of the world, 
beginning with Adam and Eve and everything they did, and you go down through the history of mankind, it's nothing but sin and war and death. Okay? Now, God still loves them to the extent that those who will not have not committed the unpardonable sin, he will raise back to a physical life. But he doesn't love them in their sins in the way that God loves us when we repent and the blood of Christ washes away our sins. And we receive the Spirit. See? That's why we are labeled as the called, we answered it, the chosen. And if you repent, God chooses you. Okay? And the faithful. You're faithful unto death. Okay? That's what we're dealing with here. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, had made it alive together with Christ, for you have been saved by grace. Now, there it is. Saved by grace. This does not mean eternal salvation all at once. This means by grace you have been saved from all your sins and trespasses, because you have repented. That's the first step of salvation, right? Okay. Now, here's a prophecy. This one is a prophecy because it has not yet happened and won't happen until Christ returns and the first resurrection takes place. And he has raised us up together and caused us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay? That's a prophecy. That will happen. How do we know? Verse 7 tells us. Okay? Anybody here been raised up to the throne of God? <laughs> no, that hasn't happened yet, right? No. Some people may think so. Okay? So that in the ages that are coming, that's when that will take place. See? We won't sit in the heavenly things until we're spirit beings. Okay? That's the whole goal. But that's in the ages that are coming. He might show the exceeding riches of his grace. See? And that's quite a thing. The grace of God is marvelous. Stop and think about it for a minute. How many people in the world have God's Spirit? Not very many. Those with God's Spirit have direct contact with God's Spirit to God the Father and Jesus Christ. Because it's done spiritually, you don't see anything. But you believe and you trust and you pray and you study and you keep the commandments of God. And then all of these things become more evident as you go along. And that's called growing in grace and knowledge. Right? Let's go on here. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is especially not of your own selves. It is the gift of God. Now think about that a minute. Okay. You have faith to a certain degree. But what really gives you faith unto repentance and salvation? God's grace. Okay. Not of works. There, oh, boy, the Protestants love this one. Not of works. See, you don't have to do anything. Now, hold on a minute. 
You've got to read the whole story. See? It's like this. If someone came to you and said, you won the lottery for $10 million. Oh, you did. Oh, what, 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 what would you think? $10 million tax-free. Okay. We'll get it to you tax-free. Boy, you're already spending it in your mind before you find it. But then they say, well, you have to sign this. Okay. So you sign it and expect to receive it. And then they tell you, well, you haven't yet been selected. So read this paragraph. So they read an exclusion paragraph that even though you signed it, it cuts you off. See? <laughs> now, that's the way Satan works. God doesn't work that way. See? Not of works, and this is your own works so that no one may boast. Who can you think boasted the most of any man in the whole Bible? Job. Just think what it would be like to meet Job if he made it because of his own works. He would look down on all the rest of us slobs. <laughs> Now you know why God had to deal with him the way he did. Because he had to learn a lot of lessons, okay? Now notice verse 10. Here shows the next phase. Okay? The next phase, which is, and we'll get to some scriptures, but the second phase is, are being saved. Phase two, are saved being saved. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, and that means being created. See? It's a spiritual process that God is doing. Unto the good works. Uh-oh. Now it says in verse 9, not of works, then it says here, unto the good works. See, so the works in verse 9 are your own works. The good works in verse 10 are what? All the good works that God wants you to do. We'll cover that in a little bit in the second half. Okay. The good works that God has ordained beforehand in order that we might walk in them. Now, why do you walk in them? Walking is a process, right? So if you are being saved, you are walking in the way of the Lord. Correct? Yes. We might walk in them. All right? Let's see. Come to Colossians, the first chapter. Okay. Let's see it here. Virtually the same thing, okay? Written a little bit different way with some other interesting facts added into it, okay? Chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, from the day that we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now that comes a bit at a time. See? God just doesn't scoop it out, one big scoop, and all of a sudden, you know everything about God. No. He wants you to pray, wants you to study, he wants you to look into the word of God, he wants you to walk in his way. That's all part of it, see? that you might walk worthily of the Lord. There it is, walking in the way of the Lord. Now it says in 1 John 2 that we are to walk also as Jesus walked, right? All right, there we go. Unto all pleasing, being 
fruitful in every good work. There's that word again from Ephesians 2, good work. And growing in the knowledge of God. That's part of being saved. Okay? Being strengthened with all power according to the might of his glory unto all endurance and long suffering with joy. Giving thanks to the Father. Now this is this is really quite a thing here. Think of this. Sometimes you ask the question, well, why did God call me? You know? Who am I? Look at all the billions of people on the earth. And who are we? That God would call us. But he has. Okay. Hey, we probably wouldn't be selected into some of the some of the elite clubs of this world because, you know, after all, we're just nothing but riffraff to them. See? Notice this, what the Father has done for us. Verse 12, giving thanks to the Father who has made us qualified for the share of the inheritance of the saints in light. Okay? Isn't that something? Remember what Jesus said? There's treasure in heaven waiting for you. Just paraphrasing it. Huh? We don't get it now, but we'll get it at the resurrection. Okay. Now notice verse 13. This is important. Who has personally rescued us from the power of darkness. See? Remember how that ties in with the first couple of verses in Ephesians 2? Prince of the power of the air, the power of darkness, and has transferred us under the kingdom of the Son of His love. Okay? Now, we're not under jurisdiction of the world in the final analysis. Yes, we've got to be law-abiding and good in the world. That's true. But our standard of living comes from where? The kingdom of God, as expressed in the gospel, which is coming from God the Father, and we're going to help bring it to the whole world. See? Now think what a great thing that is. See? That's why God has chosen the people he's chosen. See? To confound them. And a lot of them are going to think, well, why did God do that? Because you didn't think enough about God to repent. That's why. Okay? Let's go on. In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the remission of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean that Jesus was born and was not God in the flesh? No, it's defined in a couple of verses here, just a little right after this. Okay? Is God creating in us his character? Are we all then a creation of God, physically and spiritually? Yes. And we'll see he's the firstborn of those to be raised from the dead. Is that not a new creation? Will that not be a new creation when we're raised from the dead? Yes, of course, it's going to be a spiritual body, right? You're not going to come up with the same old rotten body you were buried with. I mean, what if some of those have been in the, in the ground 5,000 years? You know, there's nothing left to them. That's why you have the spirit of man. God's going to put it into a spirit body, a spirit mind, and give us eternal life. Because by him were all things created, the things in heaven, the things on earth, the visible, the invisible, whether they be thrones or lordships or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all. 
that is, in eminence, in authority, and everything. By him, all things subsist. Okay? Remember what it says in Hebrews, the first chapter? Okay? We'll pick that up after the, uh, after the break. It's time for us to take a break. We'll take a 20-minute break. And you can go get your snack and come back, and we'll continue. 